truth over lies. And we will make America great again. I feel incredibly grateful to New Jersey. More Americans voted this election than ever before in American history. He says we are going to court. Protesters on both sides of the political divide took to the streets Wednesday. The people have the power to build a better future. Who doesn't see red states and blue states, only sees the United States. Focus Democracy, from the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University, here's Grace Rowland and Louis Biondalillo. Welcome to Focus Democracy. As you can see, we're not in person, but remote. Since the semester started, a large team of students have been reporting, interviewing, and researching top issues facing the country, as well as here in New Jersey. With Joe Biden as the president-elect, we will be covering the topics of COVID, Black Lives Matter, the Supreme Court, climate change, and much more. Joining me now is renowned American journalist, MSNBC analyst, and New York Times best-selling author, Jonathan Alter. So you've covered 10 presidential elections, and this was an unusual one. So what's been different about this election compared to others that you've seen? This particular president of the United States does not respect our, our, our traditions and is making baseless charges uh, that relate to uh, the core of our democracy, which is a dangerous moment for us. So we're all living through a... Um, uh, what I hope is not going to become a, a constitutional crisis or a cold civil war, but is is a, a very uh, perilous situation. Um, and it was just a good thing for our country that he lost the election. So how do you think President Trump will handle the transition of power? Poorly. Uh, he's uh, He indicated before the election that he was uh, that the only way he could lose would be if the election was stolen from him. and then he suggested, you know, immediately that it had been stolen without any evidence. It would be rather hard just to take a step back and think about it. How could you steal the votes for Biden, but not steal the votes for the Senate candidates below that? I mean, you can't like rip, rip the absentee ballot in half and say, okay, well, this part for the Senate candidates who are Republicans counts. This part for the presidential candidate is phony and made up. I mean, the whole thing is preposterous. Everybody has called it for Biden. So he is the president elect. And you now have this situation where the president will not do the right thing and, and allow a, a, a lawful transition to go forward. We can't say we weren't warned before the election. Trump said, you know, I don't guarantee a peaceful transfer of power. That's the first time in American history any president has said that. So, you know, we knew this was going to be a really bumpy ride. Um, and Trump uh, lived up to expectation. If he still refuses to leave on January 20th, he will be escorted by the Secret Service off the White House premises. So before Biden was called for the presidency, news channels cut Trump off mid-speech because of misinformation. So how do you think journalists and news outlets are going to tackle another politician like Trump or even Trump himself in the future? This is a really great question because this is the first time in, you know, in, in our lifetime, really, that that the media has done anything like that. It, in the past, it's been assumed that, you know, if the president says it, it's news. Maybe you challenge him afterward, but you don't call him a liar. You know, it's certainly not in a straight, you know, news environment. I mean, maybe, you know, critics writing for political magazines might call, might have called Nixon a liar or, but you, you didn't see Nixon, and I'm old enough to remember this, you didn't see him called a liar on television, even though he was. It's just that wasn't the way our system worked. And we had um, you know, other ways of holding him accountable is that Republicans should be, if you have, a lot more should be saying, look, as our foreign uh, allies uh, around the world are saying, as everybody has indicated, as even Fox News has indicated, this election is over. Get with reality. That's not happening. So it's fallen upon the media to do things that we're not really comfortable doing, like cutting away from the president when he's not telling the truth. People think that's what our function is. That's not why the U.S. Constitution singles out one private institution, the press. It's the only private uh, industry that is mentioned in our Constitution. 
because they want it as a check on power. And our obligation is to truth. The straight news reporters and anchors, as we're learning in recent days, their obligation is also to the truth first. And if you have somebody who is lying, you're getting used, you're getting exploited. If you just convey those lies without holding that person accountable for the truth. And that's why you saw so many people cut away from Trump, because what he did was not only untruthful, it was dangerous in conveying the impression uh, that uh, fraud had taken place when they haven't introduced any evidence of that fraud. Do you think that this election will make it to the Supreme Court as it did in the 2000 election? You know, I don't know for sure, but I don't think so. So already the Supreme Court has three times refused to review a Trump challenge in Pennsylvania. And I, I think um, for it to go to the Supreme Court first, it has to uh, you know, get some kind of a decision at US District Court, and then it can go up on an expedited basis fast to the Supreme Court. The odds of um, there being an, uh, enough evidence with an emphasis on evidence, because you know, the Supreme Court doesn't, it doesn't care what some loudmouth on television says. They're looking for evidence, affidavits sworn on penalty of perjury of wrongdoing. And unless enough evidence is presented to them to reverse the election, I think they just won't take the case, you know, and he has hundreds of lawyers working on this. So we don't know yet when those legal remedies will expire, but we, I think we can be confident that uh, Joe Biden will take the oath on January 20th. So what is the biggest challenge facing President-elect Joe Biden? Well, I guess it would be the coronavirus and getting it under control because we can't fix our economy until the virus is under control. And so Biden already has brought in a team of true experts who will give him high quality advice. And the problem is that they can't start planning for how they will combat the virus uh, until uh, we have an orderly transition. If we don't get control of this soon, it, it's gonna kill a lot more people. And so there are stakes here to Trump's uh, unconstitutional uh, narcissistic ego trip that he's on right now. Thank you so much, John, for your expertise. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Amy Coney Barrett's appointment to the Supreme Court was recently confirmed by the Senate, voting entirely along party lines. What does this mean for the future of the country? Carter Winter reports. The yeas are 52, the nays are 48. The nomination of Amy Coney Barrett of Indiana to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States is confirmed. With a new conservative justice on the Supreme Court, some are asking how this will affect the future of American politics and Joe Biden's presidency. I sat down with political science professor Bridget Callahan Harrison to discuss what you can expect to see. So the first thing I wanted to talk about um, was the recent passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Could you tell me a little bit about how her passing impacted the country, impacted the state of the courts, just everything in society? Sure. So, I mean, you would have have to be living under a rock not to recognize that, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg kind of became um, a pop icon, a folk hero in the last couple of years before her passing with Ginsburg on the court, there was perhaps a moderation in the kind of cases that, that the court chose to hear. That will end. And so the kind of things that we have kind of taken for granted, things like the fact that Roe versus Wade, the, the Supreme Court decision that essentially made abortion legal throughout the United States with some um, kind of constrainments, I think that that is no longer the case. I think that there is, um, when you look at some of the more recent rulings, whether it is things like gay marriage or uh, finding political organizations and corporations as having the same free speech rights as um, individuals, we may see an even further um, manifestation of conservatism that the court undertakes. And uh, I think that everything's on the table. This could be the most longest lasting legacy of the Trump administration. With a 6-3 court, what this means 
particularly when you consider the fact that so many of the justices who are conservative are also very young. And what that means is that this is a court whose lifespan will be with us for the next at least two decades. It's clear that the court would have a mandate to have a much more conservative um, bent. And I don't know that many millennials or Gen Z um, people made the calculation that the election of President Trump could have such drastic impacts for such a long time. So I think that a lot of people, when President Trump was elected, was like, oh man, this could be have sweeping implications in X, Y, or Z. But everyone thought, well, are we over in four or eight years? Do you think that they'll use the Supreme Court as a deciding factor in the election, similar to what happened with like Bush versus Gore? We've heard the president of the United States call, call into question the legitimacy of some of the elections that are being conducted in the state. And it would be very plausible for any court challenges that begin within a state to wind up in the U.S. Supreme Court. So it is not out of the realm of possibility that this Supreme Court will actually be making some decisions that impact the outcome of the presidential election. Joining us today, Christian Lundberg, an associate researcher at Circle, which means the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement in Massachusetts. Christian has worked on research projects at Circle, including county by county analyses of voting patterns in the 2020 primaries. Thank you, Christian, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. What this election was all about was young voters, young people voicing their ideas. We've seen that all year. So what is the state of youth voting this year? So we're still crunching the numbers and there's still a lot of data and a lot of votes that have to come in. But so far we've seen some really encouraging signs when it comes to young people making a difference in elections. So across a whole variety of different states, everything from Georgia to Arizona to Nevada and so on, young people are making a difference by turning out in large numbers and also in who they're voting for for president because oftentimes young people are voting differently than older generations. And in doing so, flipping the outcomes in certain the states, especially because there are a lot of states where the outcome is still up in the air and still um, to be decided. So the fact that young people are voting in the numbers that they are and supporting the candidates they're supporting is really pivotal and could very well alter the composition of the Congress and who is in the White House. There was just one reason. What is What, what do all of these young people have in common that they really, really want to see change? Sure, that's a really good question. And I would say that instead of focusing on what young people have in common, um, and they do have a lot in common, young people in general bring a lot of expertise when it comes to their communities and when it comes to like sort of living in America today. But young people are also very different and very diverse, the most diverse generation ever. And because of that, young people in certain states and in certain areas or young people of different backgrounds or of different races will vote very differently as well and will prefer different sort of candidates. So it's important to recognize that in particular, like the, in some places, young people such as like young black voters in Georgia are voting in ways that really do differ from young white voters or young Hispanic voters. And as a consequence, they are making their own individual impact on the elections. So to say, so there's definitely a lot of different sort of factors going on, but it's also true that young people are really stepping up to the moment. They're believing in their own power and they're making a difference, both at the ballot box this year, but also through other forms of activism, such as protests, participating in social movements, participating by helping out their neighbors and their friends and their families in their communities, helping respond to COVID. So young people overall have shown a tremendous amount of activism and a tremendous engagement in civic life so far this year. But it's also important to remember that young people are also very different and are engaging in their own ways. Now, you mentioned the protests, and we were definitely going to be talking about that because it's, it's a huge news story this year. In the 1960s and 70s, we saw young people protesting against the war. How does it compare to the 60s and 70s protests, these Black Lives Matter protests? Do we think that it has as big of, of an impact on the election? Well... In terms of the impact on the election, one thing that we can say is that these protests did a really remarkable job 
at sort of linking the uh, protest and activism through social movements to activism through the ballot box. A lot of the organizers who were often young people themselves, which is very important, it's very important to have young people in these positions of authority and positions of leadership in media, in activism, and in their communities in general. So young people being featured and telling other young people to vote is a really inspiring and a tremendous force for change and a tremendous motivator for other young people to actually head to the ballot box and cast a ballot, or I guess send in their ballot by mail, because that also was a, um, I guess, a way to vote this year too. Where do we see these generations? We're talking about millennials, Generation Z, generations that come after Generation Z. In 10 years from now, what impact will they make in the next 10 years? Sure, that's a really good question. And um, it's hard to sort of make predictions, but what we do know from research is that young people who start voting tend to continue voting because voting is a habit. It's sort of like brushing your teeth. Once you start voting, you sort of like gain the experience and sort of like know that you can vote and that you can participate in the democratic process this way. And so that sort of is inspiring and motivating to sort of continue the process. And we can also see sort of like trends over time by looking at like, you know, millennials, a 30 to 39 year olds demographic, which also tended to vote um, for Democratic candidates, as did the youngest generation, the 18 to 29 year olds, uh, maybe not as much, but they also tended to do that. And we can see that as sort of like maybe a legacy of the 2008, 2012 Obama races, where a lot of young people were inspired as well during those campaigns and then continued voting in the sort of ways and in the numbers that they did back then. It will be interesting to see what happens 10 years from now, but it's really encouraging because we really talk a lot of, at Circle about starting early and growing voters to make sure that when young people become adults and um, later on in life, they can sort of continue voting and continue tapping into that power. Once again, that was Christian Lundberg, an associate researcher at Circle, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement in Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Christian, for being here with us today. Thank you, and I uh, hope you get some rest and some sleep after this crazy week. Absolutely. Democratic incumbent Cory Booker has won re-election for the New Jersey Senate. Also winning re-election, all 12 congressional district incumbents, though Republicans gained a seat due to Congressman Jeff Van Drew switching from Democrat to Republican and embracing Donald Trump. Incumbent Mikey Sherrill will also be returning as Congresswoman for Congressional District 11, Montclair State's District. Our correspondent Ryan Bretta has that part of the story. On November 3rd, Mikey Sherrill, the representative for New Jersey's 11th congressional district, won re-election against Republican candidate Rosemary Becky by 14 percentage points. We spoke to the Congresswoman the night before the election to hear her plans for her next term and to outline the issues the 11th district faces going forward. Well, we definitely need another round of coronavirus funding, especially that state and local funding. That's so critical to getting our schools the support they need, getting our first responders and hospitals the support they need. We passed the HEROES Act back in May. Unfortunately, that never got a vote on the Senate. Um, negotiations failed, which was really disappointing. I, I really felt like there was a pathway for some bipartisan compromise. I'm hoping that we very quickly after the election can get back to the table, get some coronavirus support passed for another round of PPP loans um, and support for all our small businesses, and then move on to how we're going to rebuild our economy. Things like infrastructure spending, um, research and development, the, the things that New Jersey 11 is really going to need to ramp back up our economy. All of these priorities coincide with New Jersey entering a second and perhaps most deadly phase of the coronavirus. Reporting from Montclair News Lab, this is Ryan Breda. The legalization of marijuana was the first question on the New Jersey ballot and the first question on young voters' minds. Zach Taglioli reports. One big change coming to New Jersey was pushed by Governor Phil Murphy. We now join the growing number of states that have come to the rightful conclusion that our marijuana laws had done more harm than good. It will still be some time until legislation goes into effect to legalize the drug. Governor Murphy is planning to add a retroactive portion to the bill, putting an end to pending cannabis cases. They hope to pass laws that possession of up to six ounces and distribution of up to one ounce will be legal. Keep in mind that until the legislation passes, marijuana is still illegal. The new chairman of the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, Diana Huyanu, has set her sights on turning the upcoming industry into something truly inclusive. My vision for the Cannabis Regulatory Commission is one that I know Governor Murphy and Jeff both share. It is one that prioritizes equity and integrity, twin values, 
in its approach to regulating the medicinal and personal use cannabis markets. Residents like Eric and Brittany are excited for the change, seeing the referendum as a chance to mend racial injustice. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, black people are almost four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana-related offenses. I am personally for it. I also feel like it's been disproportionately affecting minorities in regards to you know jail time, fines, stuff like that. So I think this will be a lot better for the whole population. Eric is a current user of medicinal marijuana. He hopes the new legislation will also loosen restrictions on medical strains. There are different strains uh, that uh, these companies make now that target specific needs, anxiety, depression, migraines. It will tremendously help as far as the government regulating it. Taxes and revenue from the sales of legal marijuana will bring economical benefits to the state says Tohan Jazdunwala. I think the industry is going to be huge. It's going to open up so many jobs with every dispensary, um, all the delivery jobs you're going to need for um, moving marijuana as well as growing marijuana jobs. It is estimated that the tax revenue from marijuana sales in the state will be more than $100 million a year. The money will go into a new state fund covering the costs of the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, training local police departments, and the rest will go into the state's general fund. And today, the barrier of our failed marijuana laws that has kept so many of our residents from moving forward and prevented our economy from growing and expanding in a truly inclusive way is about to fall. Legislation has already been proposed to legalize pot. It's going to be a long road, and marijuana fans hope it will be passed within a year. From Montclair News Lab, I'm Zach Taglioli. The pandemic has affected people of all colors, shapes, and sizes, but it's affected one group more than others. Giovanna Boggins reports. There's one community the problems of the year 2020 have hit harder than most, African Americans. They're facing two plagues, racial injustice and COVID. Jarrell Saunders Didymus is a recent MSU graduate who lives in Camden, New Jersey. A lot of people in my hometown dealing with a virus every day before this virus even came out. They're living through poverty. They're living through worse things that's been happening to them for years. As bad as living in poverty is, COVID hit the African-American community hard. On well, the African-American community, and we're doing everything in our power to address this challenge. It's a tremendous uh, challenge. The COVID-19 mortality rate is three times higher for blacks than whites. I've had three deaths in, I would say, March to July, August and it's just been horrific for our family. Genevieve Alzabar says COVID and racial injustice has left an emotional toll on the black community. They lack the mental health assistance they need. Genevieve says she's dealing with it the best she can. As a black woman in America, we learn to suppress our emotions, learn to live past it. 4.8 million African Americans have reported they are suffering from a mental illness. And Bria Willis, a director of social workers at a healthcare center, does not see a rise in people asking for help. I think it's a lack of resources. I think financially lack of insurance and also you really don't see a lot of communities or facilities that that offer counseling services in the black community. Like if you wanted to go seek counseling, you would probably have to travel pretty far. Genevieve believes she needs help but cannot afford it. I feel like that's um, money that I don't need to spend at this very moment because it's not my most important resource right now that I need. It can be stressful to be an African American in America today. Black men are about 2.5 times more likely to be killed by a police officer than white men. And black women are 1.4 times more likely than white women. Every day is the same for me. Like if I see a cop, like I'm slowing down super slow. Like if I'm walking, I'm gonna look at the cop, make sure they're not looking at me. Worrying about what can happen in two seconds. I'll just always think about death. Seeing it every single day. So the natural reaction to the body to protect itself emotionally is to numb yourself. So that's what most, especially black men, if you see a black man being gunned and killed in the street and you see gun violence, you see it every single day, it becomes the norm. This election year, Jarrell thought Black Lives Matter would mean change. In, in this election, black people are the center of attention and we still getting treated like nothing. In 2018, 58.2 black young adults, 18 through 25, and 50.1% 50 of adults, 26 through 49, with serious illness did not receive treatment. When you have a community that's so suppressed, 
and that's used to being suppressed and that's used to being an underdog and that's used to being a minority, you don't necessarily feel like you have a safe place to express yourself emotionally. In 2015, 86% of psychologists in the U.S. workforce were white, 5% were Asian and Hispanic, and 4% were Black. I don't think they could understand it unless they were the type of person that lived through my shoes or lived through my traumas or my obstacles. I still want to seek counseling. I only want to see a therapist who can relate to me. That's why I've been holding back. The starting point for change is teaching that it is okay to express positive and negative emotions. Natural reaction is anger, and there's nothing wrong with it. Anger, disappointment, helplessness, depression, anxiety, feeling like you want to give up, suicide. I encourage people to get more involved in the issue. Instead of sitting back and just moping about it and being upset about it and allowing that emotion to overcome you. COVID and racial injustice can be overwhelming. The message here is seek help. It can save your life. From Montclair News Lab, I'm Giovanna Boggins. 2020 has been the year of COVID and its devastating impact all over the world. Reporter Teresa Gomez has a story of three New Jerseyans and how the virus affected them. When New Jersey had its first COVID cases, many people were confused, scared, and could not completely put into perspective what was happening. Everything changed. This is the story of three people and how they survived the earliest days of this pandemic. And I realized, oh my God, you know, I am actually experiencing this symptom. Sonia Bozik, a professor at Montclair State School of Communication and Media, and her husband, a Gallery Cultural Center owner, Alexander, got the coronavirus at the end of March. Initially, I didn't even notice, you know, because I only had loss of smell and I felt completely fine. My husband started having uh, symptoms and that's the weirdest thing. And I think the most dangerous because you are not aware Sonia had a milder case of coronavirus, and her husband's condition was much worse. As I remember, night before I got a fever, I have some strange uh, dreams that I'm in some very, very dangerous situation. And in one hour, I had a body ache. Oh, but when I wake up in the morning, I, I was a little bit tired and nothing more. But then, in next night, I got a fever and very strong uh, body ache. It was next 36 hours. In my joints were very painful. In that moment, I was thinking that, oh, maybe this is the end. For the entire time, we stayed inside. At that time, you couldn't get tested. There was no way we could, because New York was a crazy, messy place. We even called our primary care doctor, and I felt like the person on the other side couldn't wait to hang up. Dr. Fatima Sahamid, a family care physician in Westfield with Summit Medical Group, encountered her first cases early on. I think we didn't have enough data about COVID um, at the time, uh, it was flu season. So I was seeing a lot of patients in office. We didn't have guidelines to wear masks or anything like that. So we probably had exposure as well. We're swabbing patients all the time. So some of the patients did turn out to be COVID positive after I evaluated them, managed them. Um, we were starting to see patients that were flu negative, strep negative, and we just presumed that it was a new, like it was just another virus and viral infection um, until we realized that we didn't have a test to test for COVID. As doctors like Dr. Salhamid were figuring out what the virus was, Sonia and Alexander were trying remedies at home to help with their symptoms. It's really important to keep your lungs wet and humid, even taking showers, also to inhale cold water and then inhale that. Operation. As stated by the Mayo Clinic, air moisture can ease symptoms of a cold or other respiratory conditions like coronavirus. Sonia and her husband are both doing well and recovered. And for Dr. Salhoumi, telehealth went from something she always avoided with her patients to something she embraced. Now, if you take a look at how COVID is treated now, I can say, look, we have tons of testing. If I know you have symptoms, I'm sending you to our urgent care. They're going to swab you. They're going to tell you right away if you have it or not. Now that flu season is here and COVID rates are up, doctors are worried, but more prepared. If COVID plans to stick around that entire time, um, I think we might have a little bit of a burnout. And who's to say we won't, we won't we'll really have enough PPE? Because 
we kind of didn't. <laughs> but what doctors can't control is the spread of misinformation. According to the American Journal for Managed Care, there have been 2,311 reports of rumors, stigma, and conspiracy theories in 25 languages and in 87 countries. We have to protect ourselves, and even though we were careful, we got it. You can't gamble with your own life, and you cannot gamble with other people's life. A couple and a doctor who overcame the challenges this virus has caused. Reporting from Montclair News Lab, this is Teresa Gomez. Turning now to the power of still photography, Sarah DePippa, our social media correspondent, reports. Professor Tom Franklin's photojournalism class went around New Jersey taking photos of what was occurring during the 2020 election. Let's see what these students captured during this historical moment. In this first photo, Kamala Harris hosted an invite-only event in an effort to secure a Democratic win for the state of Pennsylvania. Emma Coughlin did a fantastic job capitalizing on this opportunity by capturing some amazing photos. Way to go, Emma. For those unable to cast a mail-in ballot on time, many gathered in Union City and would wait in line for 20 minutes to ensure that their voices would be heard this election. This photo was taken by Joni May de Los Santos. Amazing job, Joni. For many people, this year's election was an extremely emotional roller coaster ride. Anton Speck did a great job of capturing this feeling by taking this photo of a couple hugging after they submitted their mail in ballots. And for our next group of photos, Bernice Desgois took this photo showing stores across America doing their part to ensure that their customers exercise their right to vote as you can see with the voting signs here in an Urban Outfitters store in New Jersey. This photo was taken by Dylan Hoffman and is such a great photo for so many reasons. It represents the barrier that COVID has created between the American people and voting. Great job, Dylan. Next here is a photo on Montclair State's turf at the Montclair State University Recreational Center. They did their part to encourage young voters to vote by creating I Voted stickers as many students would be casting their very first presidential ballot. This photo was taken by Tatiana da Costa. Amazing job at capturing these smiling faces. We love to see it. At a Trump rally, this photo was taken by Drew Mumich by the Delaware River, led by someone dressed as George Washington. Despite the bad weather, people still wanted to rally together to show their love and support towards President Trump. And in our last photo, this photo was taken by Casey Corey at a drive-in rally for Mikey Sherrill's re-election campaign. Cheryl gave a powerful speech for people to vote for Biden and Harris in this 2020 election, and also to support her campaign. The crowd would honk in support as Cheryl delivered her powerful speech. Thank you so much to Professor Tom Franklin's photojournalism class for all these incredible photos. To see more of their work, visit Instagram and use the hashtag, hashtag SCM underscore photojournalism 2020. Thank you and back to Grace and Lewis. Now is Lee Marengoff, expert on public opinion and director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion. So we saw numbers everywhere this election cycle. <laughs> um, we, we saw, we thought at one point Donald Trump was going to win this election. Uh, it turned out not to be that. Could you explain what happened first off? Well, I think, you know, there, there, there was a lot of variety of polling. I think that's, uh, there are people using different modes of collecting data, people doing live interviews on landline and cell all the way to IVR and all, all kinds of online methods of reaching people. And so I think that, that accounts for it. I think also, um, you know, it was an unusual environment uh, that we had. Uh, and particularly at the end where we had so many different ways, not only were the pollsters conducting their polls, but different ways that people were voting by mail, in person, uh, on election day, in person, before election day. So uh, that presented a real difficult environment for the polls. And then we have the, you know, the partisan polls, which are showing up on you know, clear politics, and those have, you know, a... a, a, a a spin on them as well. So I mean, there was just lots of numbers as you correctly identify. The numbers between Trump and Biden were fairly consistent and the president's approval rating was fairly consistent over time. He was in the low to mid forties uh, and that's sort of where he's been for the longest of times. Right, and we saw something sort of similar in 2016. Uh, we saw polls that were, that, that were saying that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election completely hands down 
and obviously we know that didn't happen. And a polling group said that they were making adjustments to make sure that that didn't happen again. What were some of those adjustments and why maybe they didn't work as well that we thought? Well, I think the big adjustment people made was they were starting to weight by education, adjust their sample to match uh, because they were afraid they were not getting the sufficient number of uh, people without a college education who are more likely to vote for Trump. And that was the takeaway from 2016. I always thought there was a danger in fighting the last war, uh, and we did not adjust that way. We thought the difference was more one of geography, that there's a wide chasm uh, between the urban, suburban voters and then the rural vote. And I think we've seen that in 2016. I think we also saw it in 2000. And I think this time it was even wider and deeper than it was in uh, 2016. So I think, um, you know, it's less about the demography and more about the geography of where people are living that, that makes a difference. So our numbers, you know, are still, you know, it's premature to totally do the post-election poll autopsy uh, because the numbers are still coming in and everybody likes to calibrate them in, in such precise terms. I think that there's a difference between what the polls say and what these forecasters say. And I think the forecasters, the ones who are in the predictive business who talk about a 90% chance that either Hillary was gonna win or that Joe Biden was gonna win, um, that those probably do more to spin the attitudes of, of the pundit community than the polls even do. Those are very different. And uh, those are really, um, we, they, they, along with the polls, do not communicate as well as we all should be doing what uncertainty is, and that polls are estimates within a margin of error. And so, you know, if you look at a number, it looks really precise, but it's really not as precise as it might appear. So some have said, after looking at these past two presidential election polling and seeing that maybe the numbers weren't spot on, mm -hmm. um, they are wondering, is this a polling issue or is this a Donald Trump issue? Are, are people that support Donald Trump uh, unwilling to share that opinion? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, you know, I, I've heard about, the, you know, obviously this so-called shy Trump voter. Um, and I think I've never really bought into that either. Uh, you know, I think that Trump voters, if anything, are the opposite of shy. I think they're very much uh, committed and loyal to him and they've stuck by him through thick and thin uh, as he said originally when he was a candidate in 2015, 16, that that was uh, what would happen. Um, so he has a very loyal following. He's done nothing but reinforce his base uh, all along. And I think that if you're a Trump supporter, you're more likely to be a Fox watcher. You're more likely to listen to conservative radio. Your friends and family might also tend to be that way. You, in other words, in your community, as I mentioned before, the geography, you know, if you want to know where the Trump people were, just go around the rural areas and see all the road signs, you know, the, the, the front yard signs that were there. I mean, people were very, you know, proud of their support for him. Um, and I don't think that that was the issue um, in, in the polling then or now. Um, I think that maybe other factors uh, that can contribute to this. Uh, I may have to do with, you know, response and who's able to reach, you know, how we reach people in our various methods of doing the polls. But I don't think uh, the Trump supporters were reluctant to share their opinions. Uh, we didn't find that. Uh, I mean, when you're on the phone with Trump supporters, I mean, it's really clear. They have a lot to say and they're very proud of their positions about it. So Mary's polling obviously does a lot more than just the every four years. You, you guys don't just go into the office once every four years, call it a day, and then go home, do you? No. I, 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 well, we haven't gotten into the office for a while. We've been remote. But that's a whole other situation that we're all trying to wrestle with. So what advice do you give to, to individuals who are looking at these polls, trying to make sense of things uh, in the next four years and even beyond that? Uh, mm -hmm. What do we have to look for to make sure we understand the data? Well, I think that's good. Well, first of all, I would say just from the, the results standpoint, I mean, uh, if you have an incumbent, look at his approval rating because it tends to be a referendum on that person. Uh, so right now, uh, this, this election was all about Donald Trump, which was reinforced by his personality, obviously, and his temperament, but it was still about his administration, his four years in office, and whether people wanted to give him another four years or not. 
Um, and I think that that's, that's a critical thing. I think in terms of polls generally, I, I, I think people are, are well advised to, you know, remember that these are estimates. All polls are estimates. If you see a poll that has someone ahead by six points or whatever the approval rate might be, and it's plus or minus three, that means three in both directions. So that means that if his approval rating was 46%, let's say, it would be somewhere between 43 and 49%. And that's just the statistical margin of error. There's a lot of other things that can make for polls being more accurate or, or less accurate. But even within that, there's a six point, maybe an eight point spread uh, in terms of the results. Statistically, someone's you know, got 2% more or 3% more. That's not a real, not a real difference. Editorially, it's a huge difference. So if I tell you that someone's going to carry Florida by three and a half points and the error margins plus or minus three, which means a six point swing, you know, that's not editorially satisfying. It may be statistically accurate, but I think that that difference is one that I think the pollsters and the media have to be better at communicating. Um, obviously, we like leads and you know, momentum and slippage and you know, the, all the terms that come with horse race polls. Uh, change is more attractive from a media standpoint than saying, well, it's a group rate hasn't moved. Uh, but nonetheless, the accurate interpretation and communication of the results has to do with um, the, 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 uh, that these are very you know, imprecise estimates, even though the numbers look you know, really, really scientifically developed and precise. Well, thank you so much, Lee Marengoff, expert on public opinion and director of the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you real soon. Yeah, thanks so much. It's a lot of fun. According to Pew Research Center, 42% of voters say climate change is very important to their vote. Here in New Jersey, you can see the effects on the coast, but there's another hidden threat. Kaya Masiak has our story. The Unimatic Manufacturing Corporation in Fairfield, New Jersey was a metal fabrication facility that operated between 1955 and 2001. Oils used there created a contamination problem and the EPA named it a Superfund site in 2014. The problem? Dangerous PCBs, which may cause cancer and a range of health problems, are still on the ground. PCBs are incredibly long-lived chemical. Kevin Olson is a public health professor at Montclair State and works in the chemistry department. Essentially, the problem with the PCBs is if they are in some way mobilized and they can enter the food chain, then we can disperse the environment and cause downstream effects. And this is where climate change comes in. If there's a storm, it could spread those chemicals and pollute surrounding areas, including the Passaic River, and according to the EPA, drinking wells less than half a mile from the site. If they get into the groundwater and then someone uses that groundwater for drinking, well, then there's that exposure through drinking water. New Jersey possesses the highest count of Superfund sites nationwide, 114 sites. In a study out this year, the EPA found that high levels of PCBs remain in the subsurface of the site's soil and inside the building. The EPA's remediation plan has not yet been completed but outside construction projects have started around the site. I reached out to the EPA Regional 2 office that supervises Superfund sites, including New Jersey and New York. They provided this statement about the possible effects of climate change on Superfund sites. The EPA recognizes the importance of ensuring site cleanups are resilient in the face of existing risks and extreme weather events. And to that end, integrates vulnerability analysis and adaptation planning throughout the Superfund process for all sites, regardless of location. Deep EPA funding cuts and weakened environmental regulations brought on by the Trump administration may tighten operations in the EPA Superfund program. President Trump discredited the significance of climate change during a California wildfire briefing with Governor Newsom. It'll start getting cooler. I you wish just, you just watch. I wish science agreed with you. <laughs> Okay, well, I don't think science knows, actually. On the opposing side, Vice President Biden described his plans to combat climate change in the final presidential debate. Climate change, climate warming, global warming is an existential threat to humanity. The oil industry pollutes significantly. Oh. It has to be replaced by renewable energy over time. And I'd stop giving to the oil industry, I'd stop giving them federal subsidies. 
Climate change beats Superfund sites. It's an issue New Jersey will have to reckon with in the coming years. I'm Kaya Masiak for Focus Democracy. Joining us now is Professor Steve McCarthy, award-winning producer who has had a very successful career producing documentaries for PBS, 60 Minutes, and many others. This election cycle, he traveled to the battleground state of Pennsylvania to speak with voters about what issues they are facing in the state and who they supported this election. Professor McCarthy, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you were in Pennsylvania right before the election. What was the feeling in the air in such a key battleground state? Well, what we found was that there was a lot of excitement for Donald Trump and frankly, not a lot of excitement for Joe Biden. And that was interesting. Uh, people who were voting for Biden, some of them were like, well, you know, he's the, I really like Bernie, but I'll vote for him. He's better than Trump, this, that, the other. People that were like Trump, they loved Donald Trump. I mean, they had flags, they were giving, there were parades, they were driving around honking horns. There was just this excitement about him. So the polls were saying that Biden was ahead and everything. I didn't believe the polls, to be honest with you. I believe my reporting, because I talked to dozens of people, some of them just on the phone, but some of them I interviewed. And I found that there was this level of excitement that didn't quite jive with what the polls were saying. And as it turned out, we were right. It was really, really close. So our production, our story on Washington Week on PBS was right down the middle. We had as many Trump voters and time as we did Biden voters and time to them. Right. A, a key issue in Pennsylvania was the topic of police and Black Lives Matter. So let's take a look at a portion of your work right now. Next stop, the Philly suburbs. This is where I grew up, and for decades, it's been a crucial national political battleground, mostly white with a moderate streak. But the nation's raging debates, they're raging here too, especially the president's law and order message. We had these policemen that have been dealing with a lot, and they're being demoralized. Tina Hamilton organized a Back the Blue rally this summer in Upper Darby. You've been out there protesting in favor of President Trump, supporting police officers. Why is that so important to you? Law and order, safety. Uh, I don't want it to be like a free for all and a lot of crime. Tina, did you support President Trump in 2016? Yes, I did. I think that he's more for America than anybody I can think of right now. There was unrest here in Upper Darby over the summer amid protests nationwide. The town has a Democratic mayor. Barbara Ann Keffer. What's changing politically in your area? The demographics are changing. Uh, Republicans are moving further, further west as part of the kind of like white flight. Nearby, GOP activist Chris Mundioth says he supported other Republicans in 2016, but ended up voting for Trump. As soon as he became the nominee, um, you know, I was convinced that he would be the right person to lead the country. Donald Trump is my president. This year, Chris was featured in an ad supporting the president. The Democrats are trying to overturn the election. But in recent weeks, he turned. I changed my mind because of Donald Trump's uh, debate performance and Judge Coney's super spreader event and the fact that he got coronavirus, thought was very irresponsible, he didn't care about masks. And I will not be voting for him this year in this election. So, Professor McCarthy, after watching that, why is Pennsylvania so divided on the topic of Black Lives Matter and support for law enforcement? Well, I think what you see in the Philly suburbs, you see in most suburbs around America, to be honest with you, there was concern about what was happening in the cities, that it was violent, and that the Trump campaign was saying, well, if you vote for Biden, you're going to get a lot more of this because these people are on his side, if you will. The other side was saying, well, actually, this is happening during Donald Trump's administration in America. So there was a there was a big argument about who to blame. But if you saw that woman, and there was a woman that was coming next in that piece, that was her concern. She was an older white woman who lived in the suburbs. She was concerned about unrest and what a Biden administration would mean. Would, the, would this happen all the time? So Trump, of course, President Trump used that to his advantage. And I think actually got a bunch of votes outside the cities that he normally wouldn't have got. The suburbs go back and forth. They always do. And, and that's how presidents get elected, in that slim margin of that 5% in the middle that go back and forth all the time. And there's a lot of it in the suburbs. The rural communities tended to vote with Trump in Pennsylvania, and the cities tended to vote with Biden. And that's an oversimplification. I'm sure there was, there was, there was a lot of cross-voting and stuff. But generally, the battle was fought and won in the suburbs this time. Right. And like you said, even though the, the pollsters said 
that Joe Biden would win Pennsylvania by a large margin, it ended up being very close. Um, and we saw something similar in 2016 where Pennsylvania voted for President Donald Trump, actually. Some say that this election has been a referendum on his work in office. What was the final straw for some Pennsylvanians that swayed them to vote for President-elect Joe Biden? Well, it's hard to know what, if there's one thing, but certainly I think the COVID thing was huge. If it hadn't happened, he probably would have won again, Donald Trump. Uh, so COVID was huge and his response to it um, was huge. Um, some people believe that if he had just backed Fauci and company, he had just said, wear a mask, he had worn a mask, that he might have actually just made the difference and won the election. But you got to think too, he might have lost some excitement on his base by doing that too. So we'll never really know if, what, what would one thing that, that happened that, that caused this, but it was really darn close. I mean, it was really close. Well, with such a small margin, anything's possible. And it's up for all of us to imagine what would happen. Indeed. Well, thank you, Professor Steve McCarthy, award-winning producer for joining us today here on Focus Democracy. Thank you, Lewis. Schools around the country and here in New Jersey are once again seeing an increase in COVID cases and being forced to turn remote. It's been a trying year for students, parents, and teachers. Rosario Lapresti has a story of a first-time teacher who found himself not in the classroom, but in his parents' house. Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Welcome back to History Class. Connor Smith is one of the many new teachers starting his career during the coronavirus pandemic. He teaches sixth grade history at a charter school in Brooklyn, New York, and he's teaching from home. If you had told me uh, last year that my first year of teaching would be completely online, um, I wouldn't have believed you. Some of the challenges that I face as a new teacher uh, during COVID is having to transition to completely online learning, having to take professional development uh, classes and learning on the fly about how to be a teacher. Uh, I had to move back home over the summer uh, due to COVID. I originally lived in Brooklyn and worked in Brooklyn, but with COVID closing down the schools, I had to move back home uh, for financial reasons. We're actually happy that Connor's home and teaching. Um, we think it's, it's a good way for him to get on his feet and, and get a head start without having to worry about paying rent. There are some benefits to teaching online, however. I would say that engagement from families and parents has been um, much higher now. They have a, a more active role in their child's education. And I would also say that students are somehow doing great work um, and are really engaging with the lessons and the homework that they have to do. Hi, good afternoon. This is Mr. Smith calling from LPVVMA. Every once in a while, Connor checks up on his students to make sure that they are staying connected through a computer screen. Connecting with students through a computer screen isn't that difficult actually. Something that I've tried to implement is something for each day of the week that they uh, participate in. So on Mondays we look at a meme of history and on Tuesdays we listen to music before class and sometimes that uh, music has historical or political significance. I think I'm doing pretty good learning over Zoom but I would rather be present with my teachers and students in the classroom because also I think I'm preserving more when I'm in the classroom and when my teachers are in the same room with me teaching. I think Mr. Smith is a very good teacher. He's very attentive to the children. I think that given the circumstances that he just is a new teacher starting out with this pandemic, he's definitely very attentive and caring. Thank you all for a great class. Thank you for participating and I will see you all tomorrow. It's been really important to just kind of roll with the punches and go with the flow um, and learn on the fly. So um, I do feel that this has prepared me to become a better teacher in the future and be able to adjust on the fly and um, meet the needs of our students in any way possible. On the bright side, teachers are learning new skills that will outlast COVID. While online learning is most likely going to stretch through the winter of 2020, many teachers are hopeful and prepared that by the spring, they will go back to in-person learning. Reporting from Montclair News Lab, I am Rosaria Lopresti. Joining us today, we have three friends of Montclair News Lab here. We have Stephen Rumbolo, first off, who is a political science student here at Montclair State University in the graduate program. Then we have Niaja Brackett, who is a former field organizer on the Joe Biden campaign. 
And last but certainly not least, we have AJ Melillo, who is a undergrad student studying political science here also at Montclair State. Thanks for joining us today. So at the time of this recording, former Vice President Joe Biden is now considered President-elect Joe Biden. Uh, much to the surprise of many individuals that we saw through the polls, it was a very close race. Um, what do we think happened? What changed that made this race so close? AJ, do you want to start there? Sure. First of all, I want to start with saying that the race isn't over yet. The media called it for Joe Biden. Joe Biden is not yet the president-elect. We still have lawsuits and we have recounts to do. Look, if I want to say if, if the lawsuits don't work, if the recounts still show Joe Biden wins, then Joe Biden wins, but the race isn't over yet. Niaja, bring it to a different topic. We're seeing coronavirus cases rise tremendously in, in the Garden State and in the country and the world and beyond. Do you believe that President Donald Trump's response to COVID is one of the reasons uh, that he was not elected in this election? Well, that was one, yes. Uh, I don't believe that was solely the only one. It wasn't like that was the deal breaker for a lot of folks. There have been a lot of things before here that laid the groundwork. However, I'm sure that for over 200,000 Americans who have unfortunately lost someone, that could have been the deal breaker for a large majority of them. Steven? I think um, a lot of Americans would tend to agree that his response to COVID was laughable. Um, you, you send out one stimulus package that was, um, again, to use the term laughable for a lot of Americans who are unemployed and out of work paying bills. And you have this opportunity now. Well, they did have this opportunity to, you know, work in a bipartisan way and Democrats are at fault for not doing it also. Lewis, if, if I may respond to that, that Nancy Pelosi also, I, I know you did mention Democrats, but you blamed it more on Mitch McConnell uh, in, in your well, response. Well, it is his fault. Well, Nancy Pelosi also didn't come to the table, is my, is my real point. She wasn't they going to do anything. They, they, she they, didn't they, pass the bill. They did. They passed they the Heroes pass Act. They did. Um, but unfortunately, I agree with uh, Stephen that we played politics instead of caring about American lives. Thank you, Niaja. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, AJ, for all for being here, sharing your, your voices, your thoughts of young voters. Americans can have their voices heard in elections as soon as they turn 18. But what about those who aren't old enough to vote yet? Let's hear now from the future voters of America. I know that Biden and Donald Trump are running for president. His name is Joe Biden. Donald Trump also. Do you know the other person? No, I don't know his name. Donald Trump and President Trump. Oh, they're two different people? Okay. A, pre a president protects his country. They go on the news. And I also think they have a lot of paperwork. Helps decide if it's a good law or if it's a bad law. Does important work and they run their country and they decide the rules. The president takes care of our country. Chooses the Bill of Rights. When you're done with college, you get to vote for president. Well, now, since there's a virus, some people vote at home on a paper and then they put it in the mailboxes. People vote by going to a voter's box and submitting their answers. Voting means we play videos. We vote by signing papers. I would choose what's best for the country and I would make the right decisions. If our president now changed the laws <coughs> and make people help the homeless, that would make me very happy. I don't know. Well, if I become president, then I know what I would do, but I don't know right now because I'm young. If I was president, I would take care of the country. If I were president, I would probably want to have the homeless people a place to stay. People like the they speak different language and they're not allowed there to cross the border. I would change that. Some people, they don't like this person because they're black, and some people don't like this person because they're white. I really don't believe that 
um, everyone's everyone's equal and they can do the same thing you can do. I think our future is in great hands with those kids. I completely agree. And for those of us old enough to actually vote, young voters are very passionate about what they believe in. As we're passionate about the show we brought to you today, even though we're not a big news corporation, we appreciate you joining us today because we are passionate about reporting. From all of us here at the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University, I'm Louis Biontalulo. And I'm Grace Rowland. Stay safe.